Hi guys, it's Lisa Unger and I am back with another episode, whatever that word means, of Three Good Things. And I'm super excited today because I get to hang out with debut author Brian Christie. He wrote a really, really thrilling, layered, smart book called In the Company of Killers. And I, um, I was introduced to Brian by Barbara Peters at the Poison Pen, one of our favorite, favorite, favorite independent mystery stores. And I think that she still probably has signed copies of your book. Don't you think so, Brian? She, she <laughs> may. She, she, uh, they sold out of the first, um, she filled my house with cases of books uh, yeah. at the time. <laughs> And they He's went the that. first, yeah, it was great. And then I, so she sent a new uh, shipment our way um, about a week ago. So they oh, should perfect. have signed copies. Yep. Yeah. So they should have signed copies. That's at, at Poison Pen, which everybody who's watching the show knows Poison Pen. And, you know, they're definitely one of the, one of the best stores in um, our community and in the, in the publishing world at large. So thanks Barbara for connecting yeah. us and thanks Brian for, for being here. Oh yeah, I'm delighted to be here. So basically, so I've I've been doing I've been doing my um my Brian Christie research as as I do. And it's 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 a lot. There's a lot to discuss. There's a lot to talk about. You're basically like you're basically like Indiana Jones though, isn't that true? Like aren't you like essentially like explorer adventurer guy? Like isn't that your you know, your thing? <laughs> well, I made this mistake of um Trevor Noah introduced me exactly. that way. He, he said, you're basic. <laughs> but he said, so I thought, oh, this is really exciting. I'm on The Daily Show with Trevor yeah. Noah. And he says, you're basically Indiana Jones. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, this is awesome. And then he said, slash Inspector Clouseau. Oh, wait. Right. I was like, no, that's not, that's not a good, no. <laughs> right. I wasn't going to jump so, on that one. I'm very, very hesitant to jump in and say yes, yeah, because I was already saying yes, I am when he <laughs> added that. So, yeah. That was a good interview. I really enjoyed yeah, that. Yeah, I really enjoyed that it was, too. He's, yeah. so, he's so great. And that was such a, I found it really fascinating. Like the, 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 top, the topic that you were discussing with him was, uh, was rhino poaching, which was very, I mean, heartbreaking. Of course, you know, we when we talk about things like that, it, it, it's also it, it's always so um, you know hard to think about how wildlife is abused on on so many levels for for so many reasons. And we were kind of a little bit talking about that just before, but that was about um, that interview was about rhino poaching. But in the company of killers is about elephants. Is that right? Well, it begins with elephants. It begins I mean, with elephants. So I was um, head of special investigations for National Geographic for uh, uh, a number of years. I was I founded uh, the effort as a way of bringing criminal storytelling to Geographic. You know, for for from the beginning of time, they they pulled these incredible wildlife stories and they tell stories of endangered species, um, but they never really told. Uh, they never put a spotlight on who was making this animals endangered. Right. And uh, I, they asked me, they had a, were having trouble with a story uh, that they wanted to call Asia's wildlife trade. And I'd been uh, doing some criminal investigations in that space. And they said, if we gave you the assignment, what would you do? And I said, there's only one story. There's a kingpin operating in Southeast Asia. They call him the Pablo Escobar of wildlife trafficking. I go after him. And they said, we don't do crime. I said, you know, of course you do. <laughs> Every one of your stories about an endangered species right, is exactly. a crime story. You're just forgetting the villain. Right. You've got this victim laid out. And uh, so they gave me a shot. And I, I put together a three-year investigation and went... Um, uh, targeting him and and um, part of it became a book, a uh, nonfiction book called The Lizard King. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so that's a long intro to your question, is it about elephants? So I, I moved to elephants and, right. and and did a lot, spent a lot of years on, on elephant poaching. So I wanted to open the book with something that I felt I knew very well and that could set an emotional 
tone for the reader and and have the stakes be apparent for my protagonist right up front. Right. Um, but the book itself, and the reason I chose the title, the book is my effort to move, and it's the reason I left National Geographic to write the book. Uh, mm -hmm. It's my effort to move past wildlife crime to the bigger crimes, um, transnational crimes, corporate crimes, uh, you know, using international banking and surveillance technology and, and militaries. Right. Um, which is really, which is really, I mean, the you know, wildlife sort of is the victim of all these other, like, kind of bigger crimes that are, are going on. Yeah, well, it certainly is. And so are the people on the ground that get, kind of get lost. Of you know, course. Americans like their elephants. Uh, and they don't like to spend a lot of time on the community, African communities that are you know, expose those elephants on a daily basis. And mm -hmm. for me coming home from, you know, I'd spend weeks and weeks in the field going after some pretty bad guys. Uh, and I would come home to Philadelphia and there'd be a homeless guy in the park directly across the street from me. Mm -hmm. And I had just spent a year maybe working out how to go after a guy who was poaching an elephant or trying to poach an elephant that I knew of. Uh, and then there's a human being on the street in front of my house that I have not done anything for. Mm -hmm. And that really affected me over time. And I wanted to switch, uh, alter and start telling stories that affected people around me um, in, in very direct ways and not just, not just uh, tell animal stories. Right, exactly. And so then, so what led you to, what led you to make the move from, from nonfiction to fiction? And obviously you'll probably continue to be an investigative journalist and that'll, you know, continue to be your passion. But what did you feel that you could accomplish writing fiction that you maybe couldn't accomplish writing nonfiction? Or was it a different reason altogether? Yeah, f fiction's always been my first love. So I don't, I will go back. In fact, I'm working out a, a, an investigation right now, but, but they will mostly now serve my fiction mm -hmm. and maybe I'll publish them as, as journalism as well. But um, I, I've always been drawn to, um, you know, the, the joy of unleashing your subconscious and <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> Something yes, you know sure. about, right. <laughs> and uh uh discovering what is inside you that you weren't aware of yeah. and seeing and, and that mostly for me I, it doesn't come when i'm speaking very easily uh, mm -hmm. but it does come when i'm when my fingers are moving at a keyboard or right. or i'm moving a pen right um so i i got into journalism really because i couldn't sell a novel i um my first novel was a the idea for it um, was a thriller um, and I had a meeting scheduled uh, September 11th, 2001 uh, oh. with my agent uh, in oh. New York. And so I was there, I ended up volunteering uh, wh while the towers were burning oh. um, down uh, in that area. And the, um, uh, I, I couldn't go back to fiction didn't seem important enough at the time. I, di I didn't understand that the power of fiction yet. Right. Um, so I, I some eventually, um, uh, I got time, a chance to spend time at the Iowa Writers Workshop uh, with um, a guy named James Allen McPherson, mm -hmm. uh, who is just extraordinary. And he, he introduced me to the power of fiction to, to make a difference and to, to get at real really important social issues in ways that you can you can't in nonfiction. So I've always wanted to come back to the novel. Yeah, there's a great quote about that. I and I don't know to who to attribute it to, but I will look it up before I post our video. And it's that you know nonfiction tells you what happened, but fiction tells you how it felt. Mm. And that you can go into, you know, through your characters, you can go into all the layers of a of a, you know, of a social issue. If that's what you're, you know, writing for, and and illustrate it through through your characters in a way that you might not be able to do, in in news writing or nonfiction writing. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. And you can be, 
you know, in a way you have to, you have to be able to prove every fact in nonfiction. And right. so you're limited in the facts you can put on the page. Um, and so yeah. I, I was exposed, one reason I wrote the book, I was exposed to criminal activity that I couldn't, it was outside the scope of the story assignment. Right. I was doing elephant poaching. These guys were moving diamonds and mm -hmm. murdering people. Mm -hmm. um, I got guys to talk to me about it, but I didn't have a, an assignment. Right. That sort of thing, um, uh, where you have these these things that are not connected, but they're happening. Fiction lets you pull them all together in a in a story. I think you go into that a little bit in the book, and I've also heard some of my other law enforcement friends talk about that. That like you know you have something an investigation, and you know you might have uh, you you might have amassed all this evidence, or, or you know you have you know, real documentation of things that are wrong, but unless you can find somebody to prosecute it, unless you can find, you know, the channels by which justice might be served, then you just can't do anything with it. And you just basically have it in your hands and you're like, I, who's going to do something about this? And the answer is a lot of times nobody. I, I my stomach's nodding up just yeah, right. thinking about what it would be like to be a criminal investigator, to be a cop or yeah. Yeah. Uh, FBI or something. And no something and not yeah. have a prosecutor take it. That's the beauty of being a writer. You have to have a publisher to take it. You have to have a publisher to take it. But, but you can yeah. at least write it down even for yourself if you, right. if uh, right. I, 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 the idea that I would know, uh, I think that's one reason I'm a writer because mm -hmm. if, if it's important enough, I, I will alter my life to get that to the page. Right, in some way. Yeah. right. Yeah, it, it's interesting. It's an interesting, um, you know, element to investigation, both, you know, journalistic and uh, law enforcement investigation. This is something that really surprised me when, when I learned it. And then of course, you know, you think, oh, of course, I mean, there's this machinery, right? This machinery for justice or this machinery for greed. And, you know, certain things just kind of get ground up, get, get ground up in that machinery. And there's not, you know, some, it's, some, it's so big and so right. layered and corruption is so, you know, endemic that a lot of times, you know, the, no, no justice is served. And that's why I think a lot, a lot of times people do turn to thriller, thrillers in, in crime fiction writing, readers and writers, you know, we turn to it to kind of metabolize like the chaos that we perceive in the world, right? Like in a fiction book, there's a beginning and middle and end. With some type of justice usually is served, um, not so in the real world. And I think it's a, a lot of us turn to crime fiction. Yeah, I mean, that's why I, that's why this genre matters to me. I mean, I, I think the thriller, um, first of all, it's got a really strong back. You mm. know, a thriller can carry uh, a lot of weight. It can. And yeah. if you're um, if you want to take on uh, important issues, um, even in this case, global political issues um the, the thriller is your man uh to, to carry that uh mm -hmm. um and, and, it, and it can sustain a complex story i think in ways that are still enjoyable for a reader and uh so uh, yeah i i really and it's fun you know it is <laughs> Yes. It can yes. be really fun. Well, so you said fiction was your first love. And so this is my, you know, I, I kind of sprung this on you right before I hit record, my whole three good things um, element to this. But do you have, so can you think like, is there a book that was like, you know, where you fell in love with fiction? Or is there something that you return to again and again for inspiration or even just something that really transported you recently, like something that you've read? So I try to read really widely, obviously, and we all do. Um, I would say uh, for this project, um, I came back to uh, to two guys repeatedly, um, uh, John Le Carre, because I was doing a global espionage, and yeah. um, I really thought that the, that his first, or not his first book, but his early book, Spy Who Came In From the Cold, um, which you know, was set all, about 50 years ago, uh, I thought, oh, you know, just exploring what's the, what's the version of his world, the Cold War, 50 years later, what's, the, what's today's Cold War? 
And so I thought that would be really a fun thing to do. So I spent a lot of time looking at how he crafted that book. Um, and I enjoyed it. It's one of his more simple books. He doesn't get distracted by class as often. And, and, mm -hmm. um, and then Elmore Leonard uh, mm -hmm. and James Elroy, they're kind of my elves. Uh, yeah. And I, uh, Elroy, I mean, even if you don't know what the hell he's saying, it's just his um, rhythm just really gets you going. And, uh, and Elmer Leonard in, uh, in his better books, um, he's very good at penetrating character mm. and, and reproducing um, natural speech, which is a really um, uh, important thing to me is, is to, I love the way people talk. And mm -hmm. if I can yeah. get that right, or when a writer gets that right, I just love that. Um, yeah, that's a, it's funny you should mention that because I just recently did a class for ITW on on dialogue, which will be and I'll just plug it since we're <laughs> since we're, you know, since we're big ITW fans, Thriller <laughs> Fest is coming up. Um, it's it, Unfortunately, we're not going to be gathering, but it is going to be virtual. Um, and so a lot of us have recorded um, different classes and conversations with each other about um you know things like dialogue and voice and all that so you know go to the international thriller writers website and if you're a writer or a reader it's a great opportunity to kind of you know check in and learn something and hear your authors talk about their your favorite authors talk about their craft so shameless plug for itw yeah that's great <laughs> I, I remind me i'm supposed to do a one minute video uh oh, for right. them. I, oh my gosh yeah. yeah i think i'm supposed it's to do may 1st so, is it? Was yeah. it tomorrow? Could be. Uh -oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, I'll, I'll cross that off my to do list some other time. <laughs> um, so, uh, also, another thing we talk about on Three Good Things is you know, we talk about, you know, film and, and television. Most of, you know, writers of our generation are like sort of the first. They say we're the first generation of writers to be as influenced by film and, and television as we are by books. And I know that that is certainly true for me. Like I was, you know, grew, my mom was a librarian. So I've been, you know, I've been a reader and a writer since before I could even define myself as those things. And, uh, but also, you know, she was a great lover of, or is still a great lover of, of film and uh, television and theater and stuff. And so I kind of got all that love, that love of story in any format from my mom. So I always ask my author friends, is there something that, you know, that you, a show that you, or a film that you just love, it's like your favorite, again, same thing, return to again and again, or something that just recently, you know, blew your socks off? Uh, I, I, in terms of probably the film I've watched the most, um, uh, I'm, Sad to say, given the uh, what we were talking about uh, off camera, I guess is uh, Indiana Jones, um, because uh, <laughs> and that's uh, the best. I love that. That's like one of my all time favorite movies. It's just a pure, especially when it first came out. I mean, it's just right. pure good adventure. Totally. And uh, I used to when I started as an investigator, I would I. I didn't know, I didn't have a, I had a, an uncle who was an FBI undercover agent. I've talked about many times and he, mm -hmm. he trained me as an extraordinary, um, ex extraordinarily talented uh, investigator. And you would love him because he's a, his ability to read a person mm. and, it, and, it, and it, for a long time, I basically thought, okay, what do I want to do? And if I did the opposite of what I thought I should do, generally, that's what he would want me to do. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, uh, he he had he got a great deal of pleasure sending me into fairly what I thought were fairly dangerous situations. <laughs> and he'd say, "Well, go ask this. You know, before you go, go ask this guy. Um, he's uh, involved in that world right now." And and I did that with a rabbi, and the rabbi said to me. Uh, I'd, I'd really prefer you not get killed. Uh, so I wouldn't go meet that guy. And my, so I called my uncle and I, this was early in my career. And I said, listen, he, the rabbi says, uh, he, I might get killed. 
And he said, did he say you might get killed or did he say he might kill you? Because those are two different things. And I said, I'm really focused on the killed part. <laughs> It was the and verb that really got me there, yeah. <laughs> he just thought it was all hilarious. So I would go, I, whatever he told me to do, I would do. But somehow uh, the Indiana Jones dun, 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 would, would always play in your my mind head. And you was like emboldened by it, right? Yes, it's exactly right, <laughs> exactly right. I love it. And, you know, so I, I would say that I owe a good deal to that film. Um, that I love that. That's really cool. <laughs> and I feel like there are so many films like that, that, I mean, that is like one of the iconic films of, of my childhood, I think. I mean, it was like that and like Star, Star Wars, you know, like these like sure. big sort of, you know, these big larger than life adventures, you know, like kind of walking, walking the line between like sort of fantasy and science fiction and you know, just bigger than, than everything else that, that came before it in a way. Yeah, and what I really loved was um, reading about um, George Lucas's, you know, dependence on mm -hmm. Joseph Campbell's, yes. you know, yes. um, work on myth the myth and the hero's Absolutely, the journey. Hero's journey. And, yes, of course. And um, yeah. And so that really, that Star Wars opened up a lot of things for me. Um, yes. Because then you can look at Star Wars, you can look at Luke. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, you it's know, the epitome of the, of the journey. I mean. Exactly. Well, it's, so basically, when, when, it's basically word for word. <laughs> the hero's journey, really. Correct. Right. Which, yeah. I mean, you know, historically has been a man's story. But I think that, you know, we're sort of diving deeper into, you know, the female hero hero's journey story, especially in more contemporary fiction, which is, you know, um, is the, the woman's no longer like sort of waiting on the shore for the hero to return from his, right. <laughs> his journey. Right. <laughs> or out there so we're slaying the dragons as well and every other thing. So that that's the good news <laughs> or the bad news, yeah. depending on how you want to look at it. <laughs> yeah, no, it is, it is very, uh, male that model is very male centered you're it absolutely is. right and uh and it is a big you know it's really important to break out of that i think so and, and you know and, it's, and i think that it's just a conversation that you know we're having in publishing in general and you know and and in the world and you know it's time for you know there are other there are other voices you know all and and uh, other stories to be told and um, you know, it's a very diverse and multicultural and, you know, sort of multi-gendered society. And the more voices we hear, you know, the more beautiful the mosaic of who we are becomes for future generation of readers. You know, they, they'll have that gift that, you know, the gift that reading gives to, to all of us is that, you know, you get to open a portal into somebody else's universe, you know, no matter what that is. And so the more voices that we you know, we have out there um, the different perspectives and um, and all of it is just, you know, it just, it it continues to build a more beautiful and um, inclusive canon for, you know, future readers. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I'm, and I think we really have to push past, um, you know, A, we and, and used to say, well as writers and yeah, it's all um, it's all very exciting and yeah, it is. It's good. You know, change is you know, people don't generally don't love change, but change is you know, change is good. Change is power. Change is you know is for, is forward. It's upward, and you know we have to embrace it. Yeah, and it's so much more exciting. I mean, I, I, to do this book, I was reading, you know, I went back to uh, Ross, Tom, uh, old thriller writers that are just celebrated and I'm reading their things and I'm like, these guys are not doing it for me. Um, I, everybody keeps talking about yeah. how, how great they are. And uh, it, it's in part because it's, it's from my 
opinion it's too far removed from the time to enjoy them True. in the same way and um so it's that said to me whether you realize it or not what you write is going to reflect on your time and and for sure um, absolutely yeah. yeah yeah absolutely um it'll be interesting to see what people you know a lot of people I, I guess you probably get this question as a writer as well that you know often people say well you know what how are you going to is the pandemic is you know this past year and a half going to wind up in your books and you know i always say you know like i mean that's certainly something like every experience like if you're writing from your center if you're writing from like kind of an authentic place like every big experience you have in your life at some point is going to influence your fiction right like it can't not but for me it would have to be very it would have to very organically find its way onto the page. Like I'm never going to sit down and say, which I could never do anyway, even if I wanted to sit down and like, I'm going to write a book about, you know, I'm going to write a thriller set in the pandemic. Like that's just not how things work for me. Like I have to have a character voice and a feeling and the whole like thing. Right. So, um, but like, I just, I wonder what, I mean, but of course it is going to influence everything it's gonna it's gonna change i mean like everyone keeps saying oh we're gonna go back to the way things were but of course we're not nothing's ever gonna go back to the way it was it's just gonna be like a new normal right and then of course you know fiction and art and film and everything is gonna be influenced by what we've learned and what we've lost and all that like so of course that that's how it's gonna be but i don't know what that looks like yet yeah I, you're you have a higher uh, view of the human heart than I do, I think. Uh, I <laughs> feel, <do>. so, <clears throat> you know, after 9-11, um, uh, you know, I was there uh, and saw the people walking out of the building, uh, out of the, just covered in dust and those that survived. And uh, I thought, and people said, uh, we'll never be the same. Mm. Cynicism is dead. I remember uh, a, a agent saying that to me and- I didn't we'll say never that. Go back to that. I didn't say that. <laughs> no, you didn't say that. <laughs> um, but since that experience, where well, I do remember, I was living in South Philadelphia at the time and um, everybody was um, holding doors open for people or you know, asking how are you doing or for a moment, um, which which lasted a few weeks or months, but but now I uh, so I you have more I I'm not sure what's going to happen post pandemic. I feel like the world can't wait to get back to exactly the way it was. But it can't. I mean, it's like the whole Heraclitus thing. You can't step into the same river twice. You cannot. You, you cannot go back. Things will change. It may not be for the better. And I disagree. I think things have changed tremendously since 9/11. And you know, in fact, I well, it's we will talk about that <laughs> once I hit the button. But you know, I do think things have changed tremendously since since 9/11. Well, oh, well, they've changed. I don't yeah, know. Not, for the they... not necessarily for the better. Um, right. But that's, they, they, that's certainly have, they certainly have changed. But I do believe, I do, I do believe that humanity is headed towards the light. I do believe that. Uh, it may not be linear and it may not happen in our, our lifetime. We may not see the kind of change that we hope to see. But I think it, I think that humanity is headed towards light and change and um headed to be more more than we are right now i believe that i, I would like to believe that okay fine let's talk about a recipe then <laughs> shall we <laughs> since we're gonna agree to disagree on enlightenment no um, i don't have a strong i mean i don't i just don't know i i, I no i hope, know but no it's all good I mean, it's good to talk about it anyway. But really, do you have a recipe? Do you, are, do you cook? Do you do you drink? Do you have a thing that you love? Do you have comfort food? Like, do you have a thing that you're like, oh my god, I've had such a bad day. I need to order a pizza. Like, is there anything like that? Uh, so I have um, I have one specialty, which um, I always 
pretend it's like something I just thought of as part of a whole uh, spectrum of things I might make, but it's in fact the only thing that I, <laughs> simply the only thing I know how to make, which is a Perfect. Portuguese fish stew um, oh. with, with coconut milk. And uh, it's really quite good. And, and, um, and though I don't describe it this way, it's very simple to make. Okay. And uh, so, and it's shockingly good. Um, I love it. Uh, it's cooks. I think it's Cook's Illustrated uh, recipe. But if I, if you were at my house and I served it, first of all, I would I would kind of say um, how I went to the fish market and how long that took. And uh, uh, if you if you liked it. Uh, um, <laughs> And said, "Oh, you know, how long does this is hard to make?" I'd, I'd say, oh, well, yeah. but it's actually really easy." Um, All right, great. So I'm gonna, okay. I, I'm gonna look up the recipe and I'll post it. Okay. When we, when All right. it's, it, it's but... really, <laughs> it, it, it's it, we're coming into summer now, so it's 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 a really good um, fall and winter meal. Um, but it's it's extraordinary. Okay, great. So that's great. I love that. So you did. You had a recipe. I'm. I'm. I'm I have actually, one recipe. I'm actually yeah. a little surprised. Thanks. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I thought it was going to be like, yeah, you know, straight bourbon in the glass or something like that. So that's cool. Uh, well, I do have a bourbon bottle behind me. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> do you? What? What? Which bourbon do you have behind you? Actually, this is uh, Scotch uh, Lagavulin. Okay. All right. There you yeah. go. Um, Brian, this has been very, very, very fun. I'm really glad that Barbara wrote to me and said, go hang out with Brian on Zoom because this has been excellent. And your book is fantastic and the company of killers, like very layered, um, smart, uh, just propulsive, excellent. And um, I think like, I'm just looking, I have my little notes here. Your website, is it just brianchristie.com? Yeah. Yeah. So it's just briancristie.com and you know I am Lisa Unger and um, I am lisaunger.com. <laughs> I'm, We're I'm so impossible. imaginative. <laughs> I'm impossible to miss. Honestly, like you, there is no if you are looking for me, like you will find me. So um, thanks for watching three good things, Brian. Thanks for joining me and thanks all you guys for um, tuning in and for reading. You're the best. Thank you. Bye -bye.